we're live. We're live. Welcome. Happy snowy day here in Maine. We got about two inches of snow last night. Uh, if I had known that, we would have done snow dying today, but next time there'll be more snow before the end of the year, trust me. So welcome. First, I want to thank Rug Hooking Magazine. Uh, we're broadcasting from their page, and we're going to be doing it once a month. So we're going to get our calendars together, and we will have a calendar of what the podcasts will be and when they will be. So if you have a particular topic you'd like me to discuss on a podcast, email me at orders at wcushing.com or my personal email or leave a comment on this podcast. So welcome. Today, for those that don't know, you know me, I'm Lee Sand. Uh, I, I will sit through a portion of this, through most of this, still battling a little vertigo. Thank you for all your good thoughts, but doing much better. The room is not spinning uh, unless Deb is turning the iPad. So here we go. We're going to talk about binding with wool, and this is there is a million different ways to bind your rugs. There are thousands of different finishes for your rug. The reason I bind with wool is because this girl cannot whip for the life of her. She cannot whip with yarn. This started back in 1976 when I was in sixth grade, so I was taught how to bind with wool. My when I whip with yarn, it looks like a hoop skirt in the wind. So this is an alternative. But before we go into the mechanics of how to do it, I want to step back into history a little bit to say how we used to do it. Some of you gave me questions ahead of time, and I wanted to go over it. I got the first question about binding tape. Binding tape, and yes, we have a million different colors of binding tape. It is cotton, okay? It is a cotton twill, and yes, you can sew it on ahead of time. Now, what is the if you sew it on with a machine ahead of time, you have to make sure that you don't sew it on too hard, too tight, you know, that type of a thing. Uh, you also have to make sure that it doesn't buckle, okay? Hang on, they're saying the volume. Oh, okay. You mean I'm not loud enough? Are we louder now? Louder now? Okay. Um, so when you sew this on, and you sew it on with a machine ahead of time, you have to make sure that number one, you're going to finish that size rug, and number two, that you don't buckle. And what I mean by buckle is gather it up. I guess we're still having trouble with the volume a little bit. They're saying the volume is low, but it's all the way up. Okay, volume is all the way up, so maybe turn the volume up on your device. So, if you're going to do it, and you're going to sew it on ahead of time, make sure the center of your rug does not have a ripple in it. Also, if you're a packer, <laughs> yes, yes, Deb, yes, Karen, yes, Anne, if you're a packer, and I could go on, this is not the, the course of action for you, because as you pack, you will waffle the rug. Now, what does this look like? Okay, here is an old rug. First, first hooked rug ever hooked by me. Okay, very immature, straight lines. But here is the binding tape. Okay, the binding tape was sewn on ahead of time, then hand sewn on. It's not a great finish unless you're going to whip your edge because this little bit of burlap, well, this is burlap, and it's from 1978-79, is exposed, okay? So that is what that looks like. Now, a more professional job with the binding tape is over here, and this was done by Joan, not by me, um, and this is a binding tape that matched her border. It was sewn on and then very neatly tacked down to be flat. You want to make sure your binding is flat. And Joan liked to have the, the binding tape, okay, show just a little bit. All right? And we have because there's so many colors, you can still do that. And you can sew the binding tape on. You will backstitch it the same way as wool. But you, and also, Joan's corners, in particular, are very flat. Well, that one's a little, but she eased it around and eased it around. She never mitered. Okay? 
So that is the bias tape method. Um, now, some people will whip with the bias tape. Uh, it depends upon if you're going to attach your rug to something else. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Some people will sew their wool on, their wool binding, before, that they, before they hook. Again, you run the risk of waffling it. You have to stick to that size, and Lord knows I change my mind 100 times within a rug. So you just have to be careful about it. First question I always get is, does it show? That's up to you. So I'm going to show you all the different ways of wool that are finished. It can be the same wool that you did the background in. It can be an accent to frame it. You can let it show a little bit. You can let it show a lot. That's completely up to you. With this rug, the background was this wool. Okay? So the wool was sewn on and seamed and nicely mitered and it was um, tacked down with a blanket stitch. Okay, so this is where you would pick one that you don't want it to show, you just want a nice finished edge. Now, why would we want to finish with wool? We want to finish with wool because when this rug goes on the floor, which it does, you kick this end of it. So this gets worn out before your rug does. This is wool, it wears like steel. It's easier to replace this than to repair this, okay? And please ask questions as we go along. Uh, Deb will read them to me, so that'll be fine. Now, it doesn't have to always match or it can be a part of the rug. Here we have something that is not square, okay? It's finished in a very uneven way. But I use the wool from the top of the trees. And by pleating it down, it shows the wool that was used for the top of the trees, but added an edge that accented. And I did use dyed wool for this one. You can use texture or dyed wool. And we'll go into selection of which, uh, which you should use where in a little bit. The next thing, it can be a completely different color. It can be an accent. It is not the same color, it's an accent. I didn't change it by what went around. I just wanted a thin little border because I did not hook a line to finish it. And this wool does not appear in here at all. Okay. The next one is more of a frame. And it's a, it's a nice wool, it's a striped wool, but it's more of a frame. It's more as if you were gonna whip it and you left a little bit to whip, but instead you rolled the wool over it. Lisanne, is the edging that you've hooked the same wool? On this? Yes. Yes, yes it is. This has a beauty line around it, okay? And then I use the same wool and butt it up against it. Greens are funny, they change very drastically, so a lot of times if I end with a green, I use the same wool. Uh, same thing with black, make sure it's the same color of black. But this would be as the same thing as if you whipped, you would roll your edge, tack it down, but then just run your wool over it. Okay. Sometimes the wool looks completely different than what it was hooked, but makes an awesome accent. On this one, this wool here, which is like a seed wool, I call it a seed wool, there it is hooked. And it looks completely different, but accents as a frame. So you have to decide in your rug, do you want it to frame it? Do you want it, how, what do you, how much do you want to show? And we'll go into then how wide will be the strip that you use. Is there a reason why the wool binding is so wide on your rugs? Are there any rules on this and reasons? Yes, there are. Um, on some of mine, it's very wide because I don't know, I have to figure out where it's gonna go. If it's gonna go on the floor, I will leave three inches on the back. For some reason on the wood floors, it doesn't move around as much. And that gives me more give on the floors going back and forth. 
I don't encapsulate the entire back, but if it's going to hang much like this piece here, okay, this, this wool is not in here at all. This is a separate piece of texture, but it's going to be hung, okay? So if I'm going to put it on a tack strip and hang it, or it's going to hang in a show, I'm going to leave what I think the amount of a tack strip would be so that it doesn't pull my rug. And especially those of us that use mixed media, we use yarns, we use different things, uh, then we would be particularly careful about that because we don't want that to pull on a tack strip. So can you hold the rug up so people can yes. see the whole rugs? Yep. There's this rug. This rug is welcome home. Uh, I did not use the dyed wool from the background into it. I used Cloud 9, which is a texture. And I'll go over why I pick a texture a lot of times, because a texture has a stripe, and a stripe helps keep straight. Deb will attest to that. She's doing one without a stripe right now, and it's a little crooked, but we're going to fix it. So then with this, I'll show you this one, because this really accents it with the birdhouses. The border is hooked in the same wool, but when it hooked, it hooked differently. So it added a little bit of a frame, but not a harsh frame. Someone says, speaking too fast for those with a volume problem, so can you just slow down Sure a little I can, bit? that's no problem. Try and um, push yours up, because we're up at full volume, I she, believe. So one person wrote that apparently the government has limited the amount of bandwidth within certain internets. Oh, okay. So that might be why they're experiencing yep. trouble. Sorry about that, I can't control that. <laughs> that's one thing I can't control. So, with this... Love the birdhouse. Whose pattern? Oh, that's our pattern. Uh, it's a motioner pattern. I think it's called Five Birdhouses, um, but it is our pattern. And this is an inter well, it's an interesting thing because you use up your scraps. But with this, with the pattern itself, this wool is a softer wool. This is a great pattern to go at, on a hope chest, at the end of a bed, in a guest bedroom. So I didn't use as much on the back. It's a light color. I don't need Ollie laying on it. So we put, this is more used on a Hope Chester on the end of a bed. So I gave less on the back. It doesn't need to have as much on the back. Okay. Um, the, the canoe, okay. Whose pattern? Uh, this is our pattern. It's based on the artwork of Cindy Lindgren. Uh, there's also an Adirondack chair that is the complementary piece to it. She's an arts and crafts designer. But with this piece, because it's going to hang on the wall or be a pillow, we added a little bit more to it to frame it so that the boat or the canoe becomes contained. So is the wool binding sewn on by hand? Yes, it is. And I will be showing you exactly how it's done in a few minutes. There is one other thing about the binding tape, and for those that are braiders, or know a braider, <coughs> Deb, um, <laughs> this was hooked and then finished with the binding tape like a chair seat would be. Okay? And then the braid was added. Now this is very important because lately I've seen some things that are a little disturbing where people are just tacking the linen back here or the monks or the warp and not giving it a finished edge. If you ever decide that I don't like the braiding anymore, well, when you take it off, you may have ruined your piece. Always keep the integrity of your hooked piece so that you can change it if you would like to. Always keep that in mind. So someone else is saying no volume, so just want to repeat that it's not on our end. Yeah. Other people can hear us. Yeah, the volume is not on our end. It's on a bandwidth uh, problem, but I apologize. The videos will be available later? Yep, the videos will be available later. They're working now where we can save them, so hopefully then the volume will be on because I'm actually talking louder than I normally would. 
Um, but I'm sorry, the volume is not uh, on our end. We're up as high as we can go. Okay, so someone just said, hello everyone from Rug Hooking Magazine. Yes. If you're having issues with video, please try refreshing the video or trying something else. I can't see anymore. Okay. Well, those you can read. Or it try on a the, new browser. Or try a new browser. Uh, Chrome works very well. Safari does not, just so you are aware of that. Okay, it's all a learning curve. This is an old rug. This is an old burnum. And I want to show you an old binding that has stood up to the test of time, which is a little different. And most people have Baby not powder. seen this before. The burlap was just turned over and sewn, and then the rug hooker hooked through both layers. So there is really no binding. And I don't know, a lot of us have never seen this before. I have because in 1976, it was an acceptable way to bind a rug, and I'll show you one that I <clears throat> have as a UFO and how it, how it was prepared. It's an old UFO. I don't know, are they, does, does UFOs have a life expectancy? Can we just call them possibilities at some point? But you can see the, what is detrimental about doing that. It pulls out. See, the corners, while sewn down, are the first to go. So this is really a detriment uh, when you're binding with wool to this. Okay? So I'll show you one similar on how that goes into progress. This is from the late 70s, early, maybe, no, not 80s. It is uh, on burlap. Yes, I hooked it. Okay. Um, used a lot of textures in there, but this is what we were told to do. The burlap is folded over, and the burlap is stitched. So if I were, I'm not going to hook the border because there's some holes, but if I were hooking the border, I would hook right to the edge and go through both layers. It's very hard on your hands. It's very hard to pull a four cut through it. Um, very, very hard to pull a four cut through it and not shred it. But that is how it was set up. And as you can see, it does come apart and pull. Again, my sewing machine experiences are not that good. You can see the corners are down. But you can see not even being hooked, there's some fraying already going on here. So um, it's, a, it's a very difficult process, but it's one that was accepted then. Um, just like, you know, uh, different things change through the years we learn. Well, this was acceptable then. So on to how do we pick a wool? Well, we pick a wool if we're going to bind with it, based on either the border or are we going to put on a picture frame? Okay. So. So that rec that way of sewing down on the burlap is mm -hmm. not recommended today. No, it is not. It will not stand up, especially if you're going to. And and people say, I hang my rugs on the wall. It doesn't matter. It's not going to stand the test of time or the pressure of it. I don't recommend it, but you should know what you're looking at and that this was done at one point. Okay, we have winter buddies here. And the background was a, is a wool called Flopsy. And then I started this binding, okay? I wanted to accent it, so I chose this color. Notice two things. My edges are surged, okay? Uh, they don't cover this yet. I may, I will surge it down again so it disappears under this wool. Okay? I don't leave these edges hand cut. If you leave the edges hand cut, you open yourself up to unraveling. Also, I don't fold this. I'm not going to fold this, okay, and, and attach it with a fold. Why am I not going to do it? It creates bulk, and we don't want bulk in the binding. So, as you can see, this is the stitching. I've changed colors periodically. This is the teaching, the binding teaching. Um, you get as close as you can. 
Some of this isn't as close as it should be. But when you get ready to turn it over, okay, you loosen it up and you see this is way too far away. This is what you don't do, it's way too far away. Okay, so we can come in here and do a secret hidden envelope stitch or go back again. But the technique for doing this, you notice my needles were threaded ahead of you girls coming on and guys coming on. So you didn't have to see me struggle with my glasses. So, believe it or not, while I do a lot right-handed, I sew kind of left-handed. If you notice, I have little rows. One, two, three, four, I'm on that fifth row. That's my guide so I don't get cattywampus, which is a technical term, ladies. She asked, what is an envelope stitch? I'll show that in a second. We're gonna do the back stitch first. So what you're gonna do is it's almost like a stitch in the ditch. I'm using my thumb, I can feel that ridge, and I'm gonna back stitch as close as I can or almost right through that last row of rug hooking. I am using double strand. Any special kind of thread? No, and, I'm, and here is the thread I'm using, okay? Can you see that? It is, actually it's probably, and Clark. yep, Cox and Clark all purpose. Do not use a heavy thread. I double strand it in case it breaks, but if you, and use a quasi sharp needle, do not use a tapestry needle. If you use something too heavy, this starts to gather. And we don't want this to gather, we want it to lay down nicely. So all purpose, you can use quilting thread for those of you that quilt, but you can see that where I'm going in with this. I'm going about an inch or so in the stitches. You can't take two inch running stitches. That does not work because then when you pull it, it gathers. Here's my thumb. There it is. There we go. Now, that's close. See how close I am? That is as close as you should be. And I'll fix that that's further away in a few seconds. But as I take my stitches, okay, I make sure I'm lined up, and you can feel it. It is a pressure. Uh, I wish that you could all come here and just feel it and see it. But it is a pressure, and you feel when you've grabbed it. And when you miss it, you also know that. And that's and missing it, that's okay. You can always go back. But you can see how tight I am. Okay. Now an envelope stitch. I'll show you what it, I, we, I call it an envelope stitch. It's probably called an invisible stitch. You know, every everybody learns these things differently. So Jeannie says. Yes. Do you do a stay stitch on the edge first? No. So this is too far apart. Don't forget, I learned this when I was in sixth grade. They had took pity on the sure. poor girls. Okay, we in? Can we see it? So don't despair. This is not meant to be a stressful binding. This is meant to be a nice, easy binding, whether you like to hand stitch or not. So I'm going by here, I'm going by here for a few stitches, and then I'm going up this way. On the other side, I'm zigzagging back and forth, and I'm pulling it tight. See, now you can't see. Here you can see this. So now I'm gonna come in here, just like this, and I'm gonna come back to where the binding is. Stick my finger, bleed a little, and come back. Okay, so now it's tightened up. And I'm gonna do it one more time and come up to the corner. And I wanna show you the corner in a second. So the deer pattern is one of your patterns? Yes, it is. It's another Cindy Lindgren, it's called Winter Buddies. Um, and it's, it's a fun pattern. You can make it into a pillow and 
uh, or you can make it into a wall hanging. And this can be done as a, a, a brown bird or a red bird. Uh, the deer can be light or dark. Uh, it's what you like. Maureen says it's, it's like a ladder stitch that you're doing. Correct, correct. I call it an envelope stitch because it's how we used to close up pillows. And then you're done. I knew there was another name. Thank you, Maureen. And see, it's nice and closed up. So if you miss when you turn over, it's not, a, it's not stressful. It's not a big deal. Let me just snip it, and you're done. Now, I want to show you. The corners. There is no miter on this side. You ease it around the corner. What's? It's not as hard as other corners. It doesn't create bulk. The main thing you have to be concerned with is as you come around the corner that this doesn't get cattywampus on the side you're going to. Okay? Deb's smiling because she's like, yep, I understand that. So, there you are. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you a wool. I just finished a rug. Where is it in there? You've lost track of mine. Oh, here it is. Okay. Santa and his sleigh. And the wools that I have on the table are great for binding with, uh, mainly because they have lines you can follow. Okay? So, so I maybe have, after we get through, we could talk about the names of those. Yep, that's fine. Yep, I can do that. This has different colors in the background. It's got different values. Um, this is a wool. It's called Deco Background. It's like my Irish angel, but in blues. This is not a good choice to bind. Awesome to hook with, bad to bind with. Why is that? There's no lines. You have to make sure that your stitching is very good very consistent deb shaking her head said no i'm not binding with it <laughs> so this isn't so this was a no although it goes very well and looks awesome i don't have a line to follow and the idea of binding is to number one create a good solid border but number two not to be stressful to be nice finishing do your thing with it and whose pattern, and what pattern is this? This is Santa and his sleigh. Uh, this is part of our Samya Donji collection, and it's one I just finished. Um, it's supposed to, you know, when I sit down to hook a rug, I have an idea of what I want to achieve. I wanted these to look like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer from the show that I grew up with. Um, and I want this to go on the floor. This rug will go on the floor, so it's all texture, except Ron dyed the green for the sleigh. He wanted that color sleigh. So, with the binding, this no worky. It does work beautiful, would work beautiful, but not going to do it because I want it to be, I want to do it in the evenings. I don't want to have to worry about keeping it straight. Another choice would have been the reversible black because you could have picked a darker or a grayer just to give it a dark edge. Of course, you have a line you can follow with this. It would have been easy, but it wasn't really the color that I wanted. Okay, I could go with After Hours, which just arrived yesterday. New wool. New wool. Um, I, could have, I could go with After Hours because it has the lines in it, okay? And it would look very nice. And this is how you decide what you're going to do. Now, I know somebody's going to ask if I can put cording in this. No, it creates a bump. And when you have the bump in the cording, you keep hitting it every time you walk on it. So, I thought about this, but no, I didn't like that one the best. This is too purple. This is prep school plaid but we've used it in other rugs here that I've shown you. Again, I would pick it because it has the lines. Same thing with Cloud Nine. Cloud Nine is too light. I went with everything but the kitchen sink because <laughs> it has everything but the kitchen sink in it. And what I decided to do, and by the way, I don't cut the wool, it's hand torn. 
If it's good wool, it will tear on the straight and you'll be happy with it. I don't know if I can find a piece of that. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So I tore this about six inches. As I told you just before, I have a purpose for every rug and this is going on the floor next holiday season. I'm sure Ollie will be right here and we'll take a picture for everybody or maybe Max. Um, so I did tear it. Notice I'm not going to cut off the salvage, but I'm also not going to turn it over because it creates bulk. You can cut it if this bothers you. So you would just cut it because I know it's going to bother some of you. So we'll cut it and you can just tear it just like that. It's a nice straight edge. This is hand torn on both sides for a nice straight edge. And the reason why I like this, number one, is has every color but the kitchen sink. Look how nice it goes. Okay. The second thing is I got a line right here. This is the line that I'm going to follow. So I have about an inch, inch and a half. But this is the line I'm going to sew on. Okay. So I've built in my line. I like the way it looks. So it meets the criteria. So let's start. Never start on a corner, never start at the top, never start at the bottom, start somewhere on a side. And I'm going to start close to a quarter, corner, sorry. And you work right sides to right sides? Right sides to right sides. Here's my line, right there. I'm going to line it up, just like that. Notice I'm not going to pin it. Now, if it's your first time binding with wool, you may want to pin it. I don't pin it. I find it too cumbersome. This part of the process, we don't pin, okay? Because then you're fighting the pins. If the pins move, you're relying on the pins being straight. So I have my dual purpose, all purpose thread, double stranded. Gonna put a knot in it. Is the width of the strip related to the size of the rug? Yes, it is. It's six inches, it's a bigger rug. I'm going to have about four inches showing on the back, and it's going on the floor. Um, when you have anything that's above 24 inches in length, I usually go with six inches. Below 24 inches, I go to four inches. Okay? Did everybody get that? If you didn't, I'll repeat it. Below 24 inches in length, I go to four inches in width. Above 28 inches, I go to six inches. If it's going on the floor, no matter what the size, nine times out of 10, I'll use a six inch because I don't want to have to trip on it. Okay, so I'm gonna start. So someone said they never thought about following the line. Yes, following the line works. Notice I haven't cut this on the bias. I don't have to clip it, sew it together. Remember, it was you, you're doing this and way back then, what we would do, I have to step back in time for a minute because those that were hooked in that period will go, oh yeah, I forgot about that. We would weave into this right here, our, lin our burlap then, repair kits. The noodles that we used in the rug, we would put into here or put a note in here. Well, of course, the wool fades, it gets worn, and that's gone by the wayside. That's, a, that's from a different era now. We don't do that. So Brenda says, yes. can't you put a chalk line on the fabric? You could. You could. But if I can follow this, I know this is straight, then I don't have to worry. Less work is better. So I'm taking my first stitch. I should have used white, I know. But I'm just going to back stitch on this end to secure it. So why am I doing that? So it doesn't move. So when I move down, this doesn't travel with me. So here comes my thumb. Thumb's right there, there's my line. Here's the pressure, and I'm gonna back stitch. Never turn after, make sure you've got four or five stitches before you turn because your first couple of stitches may look like they're further apart, but they're not. And remember, you can use the envelope or the ladder stitch and close it up on the other side. So there's really no stress with this binding 
unless you go a little cattywampus, then it then you get a little stressful. And if you really go cattywampus and it's uneven, the wool, you do have to take it out and pull it back around again. Are you stitching into the last row of hooking? Yes, as close as I can or into it. Sometimes I will hit the loop, sometimes I won't. But if your thumb can feel the loops, then you're close enough. So I'm going to take one more stitch and I'm going to do this just like that. But you'll feel a pressure. So here we are. I'm close enough because this will go under like that. So this is what the binding will look like. It's a nice little edge. Now, I could let more of it out. You pick how much you want to let out at the end when you turn it and pin it. You have to pin it to blanket stitch it to the back of the rug, and we have a, I have a, a rug in process with that. So Tammy says, where is the line? Is it at the last row of hooking? Yes, yes, that's the last row. And then the line in the wool, Tammy, is right here. See, this is the line that I'm following. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. There's a line like that. I could have used uh, this line here, too, but this line was very definitive to me. I can see this line right here. And that's what I'm following on this side. So Sonia says, so yes. do you buy extra wool when you're color planning your rug? You can, as long as you want to pick your background. For a rug like this, you would need a half a yard at most to bind with, at most. Um, a lot of times, under 24 inches, a quarter yard will do it. But if you're going to bind with wool, great question, Sonia. Ask for your fat quarter of wool to be cut 9 by 60. And I think hopefully the light bulb went off with everybody. Nine by 60, so you have 60 inches before you have to overlap. So let's talk about the overlap because this won't go all the way around. So when you come to the end. Perfect, because um, Sue just asked, can you piece strips to bind and yes, how? Yes, you do piece strips together. So we, when you come to the end, what you'll do, there's two things that you can do. You can Clean this up so this is a clean salvage, uh, a hand-torn salvage, not, not the uh, finished edge like that, okay? And then when I would get to the next piece, let me, uh, let me measure a piece off of the bolt here to do this. And I'll show you what it looks like after we... So I'm going to measure my width again, okay? I'm going to measure my width again, just like that, right to there. I'm going to nip it, just like that. So Jeannie asks, are you going to show us how you come around to the end and meet the beginning? Yes, I can show you. Yes, yes, I can show you that. We have one that's almost done, so yes, I can. So now I've pulled, I have two pieces. Just say I'm, before I reach the end... I'm going to nip this off again so these don't show, although I have had them show before they look pretty sometimes. You can overlap by one inch or two inches. So you would overlap as you were sewing on. Just say we were at the end. Let's pretend this is all attached and this is my end. Okay? Then what I would do, I would sew all the way to this end. And then I would lay this over, just like that, make sure they match, and stitch through both. When I turn it, I will blank and stitch this down. Okay? Did everybody get that? I'll go through it one more time. I lay it over for about an inch or so, okay? Make sure it's even on this end, on this top edge particularly. I'll sew through the two. I will black stitch through the two. When I go to turn it and attach it to the back, I will blanket stitch this down. Okay, any questions on that, Deb? No, okay. So let's see one that's in progress. Where is, oh here it is, it's behind me. Yeah, just behind me. Okay. 
This is Postcards from the Sea. Is this your first rug or second rug? Second. This is Deb's second rug. Okay. It's one of was one of her UFOs and her homework. Now, we're going to look at some things here she knows. We've already discussed it. You see here we're going to have to do the envelope or the ladder stitch here. Okay. Can you see? Oh, you can't see it. Okay. Can you get see it now? Yeah. There we go. Okay. We're going to have to go into there. Um, Deb put a beauty line around. This was the line around each postcard. She put a beauty line around, and then this is her darker border to finish. And this is her first time doing this, so at the end, she will come back and do the envelope stitch or the ladder stitch. Now, she has attached it. She has pinned it, okay? And let's look at how nice the corners are mitered. This is what they should look like. Her linen is surged and underneath, can every, everybody can see that, her linen is surged and underneath, so she has a finished edge to her linen, okay? Here's her end here. Once she sews this down, she will come back and blanket stitch this down as well. There's her other end. Here is where the two ends, somebody asked about when you come to the beginning and the end. Here is the beginning and the end right here, okay? This was her beginning, this was her end. She stitched over it, and then when she goes to pin everything down, okay, this will be blanket stitched just like this is blanket stitched to the back of the rug or buttonhole stitch. Some people call it buttonhole stitch, we call it blanket stitch. Now on this end over here, Okay, this is how the corners are done. It's folded down and then it's mitered. Okay, now that's too much of a corner, so we have to go back again. That's the bad corner, yep. We have to fix this corner. Again, this is Deb's first time doing this on this rug. Now, this is what we don't do. This is too much of a corner, so we're gonna have to take this out and ease it around a little bit differently. So this is a really good example of when you have to take out and ease it around. But on this corner, this corner here, we're taking the linen, we're folding it down, I'm gonna take this and miter it. And look at the corner. So. One out of four isn't bad. That's right. It's not. <laughs> and for her first time, that's not too bad at all. That's so, right. So someone asked about the blanket stitch. The blanket stitch was actually demonstrated earlier in yep. the video. Yep. But I will go over the blanket. Oh, the envelope stitch was done in the beginning. I will do the blanket stitch on here with for Deb and so she can see it. Um, and I'm going to do it in white because we can always tear it out. Yeah, I'm going to do it in white on this oh. one because I, I would like a lighter color so I can... Nope, this is black too. Well, maybe we, hopefully we can see it. Boom. Boom. So, blanket stitch. As I said before, remember I stitch left-handed, so you would have to adjust for those that are right-handed. I go in a different direction. Hmm, sounds familiar. Okay, Deb's gonna come behind me so she can see this. Okay, here we go. I have it in a knot, I'm coming in. Now I'm hitting the rug as well, attaching it to the rug. So, I'm gonna come here, here's my first loop, just like this to make sure I have a good starting, straight starting point. This is how I start them. Then, I take about an inch, I'm gonna go into the rug Okay, I'm not just going into linen. Somebody asked that earlier before the podcast. No, I'm at, oops, I'm getting a knot. Come on out. See, you can tell this is live. Martha Stewart would have had this edited out. Okay. How do you avoid the bulk in the corner? The bulk in the corner. To take the bulk out of the corner, and I'll show you that in a second, we'll go to the, so I'm going to sit and blanket stitch this, Okay. Yeah, you're a little tight on here, Deb. Pack it. You're going to have to call in for Packers Anonymous. Hey, it's only my second row. I know. So, 
There we go. It steamed out nicely. Steamed out nicely. There we go. So that's how we're going to attach it, just like that. I'm not going to finish this edge. I'm not going to turn this edge. Why am I not going to turn this edge? I'm creating bulk. This is hand torn. It will last. I have rugs that I've done this way that have been on the floor now for 15 years. Still look as good as the day I put them on, on the back. So there you are. So there's my finished edge. You can do a complementary color. You can do one, you know, if, if nobody's going to see it and you want to make sure your stitches are good, you might want to do a lighter color. It's up to you. The color you choose is up to you. Okay. I'll do one more, and I'm going through the stitching. As you can see it. There we go. Someone says it would hurt to do a stay stitch, would it? That's kind of how you started. Yeah, right? that's how I started was the stay stitch. Um, you could do a stay stitch, it, it, but you don't really need to. Um, you can turn it. You know, some people have asked, could you turn it the other way and do what they call a buttonhole stitch? Sure. I just do it this way because it's easier for me to hold it and control it. And I like to see where I'm going, and I like to make sure I've captured my edge. So I keep this so I make sure that my edge is captured. Did you want to talk a little bit about the pinning and, and how you yep. know okay. whether that is what you yes. want to re a reveal? Yep. Okay. So when you pin this, I lay it on a table just like this and pin it flat because this is the, this is the crucial point. Now, I've probably already decided in my head how much I want to show. So we have a little bit showing. But just say after we get this all pinned and we turn it over, you say, hmm, I want more of a border. Or I need a little, I need an inch more on each side to fit this chest that I have. So then you can decide to add more. Because you've got this left over, you haven't cut yourself short. Okay? And I prefer to pin closer to where I'm going to stitch. This is what it would look like with a little more of a border. And I'll pin a few of them so you can see. So you can pin one side and decide, or you can pin, you know, and, and pin two different ways and then just adjust the pins to what you want. So here we go. Here's a smaller one. Here's the larger one. There is no right or wrong. Yeah, I know, so do I. Deb just, yeah, Deb just said, oh, I like the larger. So she'll be repinning the top. We'll take out what we've stitched and repin. So you see, here's a little bit larger one, and then we make sure it's even. How do we make sure it's even? Look, we got a little line here. There's a little line in the plaid so we can make sure that it's even. And this is the wool. And this is the wool. Prep school plaid is the wool. So there you are. Now, you asked about taking the bulk out of a corner, but see, so it's really up to what you want. When you leave a little bit more, your last row of hooking lays down a little bit better. Notice it's a little crinkly up mm -hmm. here where it's pulled tighter. Right. So it does lay down a little bit better. When you are done, you will, after you're done binding, you will steam this again, and then everything is nice. Okay? Now, how do we take the bulk out of the corners? I'm going to... Undo it. Undo it this way. And I'm going to undo this since we're going to change how yeah. that is. So first thing that we did, okay, is we went down to about two inches. We surged the linen to about two inches. Notice we did not cut the linen. So when you do that, you can see, do I have a lot of bulk in the corner and I don't? Some people would say there's a little bit, but you do need a little bit of give. You can also do this, just like this. But when Deb came around and stitched, she clipped the corner. That takes away all the bulk from it because we don't have a lot of wool. We're not talking about four inches of wool inside. We're only about an inch, inch and a half. So that takes the bulk out of the corner. You don't want the bulk in the corner. And I prefer to fold it down because sometimes if you need a little bit of linen to repair or if something's going to give, it's going to give in the corner. And if there's linen that gives back and forth, you're better off. OK? 
okay? And then that is just folded down there. This can be a ladder or envelope, or it can be blanket stitched down. And then that would be the corner. If she wants to leave a little more, then she'd just leave a little more. But always pin your corners. Don't think that you can just stitch and it will stay. Always pin your corners. I do a line at a time, and I'll do two corners at a time, just to make sure that this is all laying down evenly. Okay? Any questions on this? So to review, this is what a finished piece would like, be like. Okay? I used, a, a, I used something that was not in the rug, okay? See my corners, they are envelope or ladder stitched down. All the corners are. This, you can see the blanket stitch, okay? And there is no bulk in the corners at all. Now the two thing, the one thing I didn't do is I didn't blanket stitch this down, which I should have. This is open, and that's, that's a no-no. Now, I know somebody's going to ask me if they can fabric glue it down. Please don't make me shudder on a live video, okay? Don't want to use fabric glue. Just stitch it down. You're stitching the rest of this. So, if you are good with your machine, okay, I'm going to say this. If you're good with your machine, if you know the exact measurements of your rug, you can sew this on with your machine prior to hooking except if you pack, because it will waffle in through here, okay? It's just a given. It's just a given. So the first part, so, 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 so Paula says, miss the first part. So mm -hmm. these bindings were sewn on first. You just sort of answered that. No, they weren't. No. Um, and it will be reposted on the rug hooking page, magazine page, if people want to rewatch it, if yes. they miss the beginning. If you miss the beginning, Paula, it will be posted um, and it will be reposted on my page as well, so that's not a problem. Any other questions on binding? What about your wools that you use for binding? These were some of your suggestions. Yes, these are some of our suggestions. These are for lighter bindings. I realized when I pulled the first batch, I realized that um, I didn't have any lighter bindings. So these are all great for lighter bindings. Now, why are these great for lighter bindings? This is khaki crazy or crazy khaki. You've got all different colors in here that show up. You've got green, you've got, I, I look for something that has multiple colors so it's not a stark line around my rug. So if I'm off a little bit in the binding, it doesn't show as much. So this is a great binding. Um, checkered past, this is checkered past. This is a medium um, binding, you know, in color, but it looks great with primitives, with dark, with brown. And again, you have your, I'm picking stuff with straight lines so you can follow it. Uh, this one as well is a lighter binding, as is this. Okay. Can and you use the wonder clips instead of pins? The clips are used instead yes. of pins in doing a quilt. Yes, you can use wonder clips. Uh, I've used pins for so, so long that the wonder clips bother me, um, but you can use the wonder clips as well. I'm just so, you know, you get used to everybody has their rhythm or everybody has what they like to use. And I've used T pins or quilting pins for so long, it's second nature to me. Wonder clips are absolutely fine. Thank you for saying that. I, would, I forgot to mention that. Um, the other thing with this binding, it doesn't have to be 100% wool. I know some people just went, what did she just say? It does not have to be 100% wool. Sometimes we get wool that has a little more synthetic, okay? Um, or somebody gives us the wool and we want to use it. The perfect place to use this is in the binding. We may not want to hook with the wool, but it does work for binding. And I have a tub of colors like that, especially when I do smaller pieces, I'll make sure. If it's going on the floor, I like my 100% wool. But if it's not, I'm not opposed to using a lighter wool or something that's mixed. So Nancy says, what, why, what if you don't have a serger machine? What do oh, you sure. use? You can, what you can do 
you don't surge and you don't have a friend that surges, you can just zigzag here with your sewing machine, two rows of zigzag. If you don't have a sewing machine, you are going to have to fray check it. You have to make sure this end is stitched. Yes, you could hand stitch it, but that's a lot of work. I would rather see you, if worst case scenario, fray check it or a, or a little bit of glue on the edges. Make sure it's dry before you start to bind it. But you can zigzag with a machine if you don't have a serger or don't have somebody who has access to a serger. Bring them some cookies and let them serge your rugs. It'll work. Labeling rugs. Yes, labeling is next. Why is labeling rugs so very important? It's important when your rugs get stolen. Before I left uh, Mississippi, I had three rugs stolen from the shop. One was returned immediately. One, the barn floor floral, which is the only neutral I have ever hooked, has never been returned. But because my rugs were labeled, one showed up at an antique shop in Mississippi uh, with my rug label on it. One of my friends saw it, and yes, I did buy it from the dealer. It's immaterial on how it got there. Uh, sometimes you just overlook it, plus you wicked underpriced it. So, here we go. This is the rug. Okay? This rug I hooked for my husband. The background is eight Pendleton skirts. It's modeled after a weather vane um, that we found in our barn in New Jersey that was snipped with tin from the late uh, 1800s. So, this was laying on a table as an antique rug. I'm not that old yet, but here's my tag. It was hand hooked by me in 2007. Obviously not an antique. I did not make this tag. Um, Elizabeth, who was very special to me, made this tag for me, but I would only use them on the rugs um, that, were, that were I was going to keep. So because my rug was labeled, it came back to me. I'm very happy about that. Now, this is not a great label. Um, but Elizabeth did this with love, and that's why I use them. Um, I don't have Elizabeth anymore. She's passed on, so very happy to have the labels that remind me of that sweet person. Um, had, we used to put our name and initials in the rug. If you have a mark that is unique to you, like a calligraphy mark, or some kind of mark that you can work into the rug to identify it as yours, do it. Go for it. Um, I got tired of hiding, trying to hide my name. I got tired of trying to hide the year. And most of us have now gone to labeling our rugs. So labeling the rug is very important. There are many different ways to do it. You can have somebody professionally label your rug. You can take muslin and you can write on with a Sharpie and then um, heat and bond it to a piece of wool and attach it. You can run uh, certain sheets of fabric through your printer and type up your label. However you want to label your rugs, label your rugs, okay? This is one way that is not expensive, that's easy to do. These are the labels that we have, okay? They're all different. Every row is different. You would take a Sharpie and you would say hand hooked by blah, blah, blah the year, or anything about the rug. If it's a gift, you can say gifted to. Make sure the year is here. You would cut this out maybe with pinking shears and heat and bond it onto wool or just stitch it onto the back. But this is a really uh, different way to, to do your rugs. It's uh, something that's kind of fun to do, unique. You know, everyone's a little different so you can customize. But let's make sure you label your rug because labeling it is very important. Um, all I can say is if this didn't have a label in it, somebody else might have purchased it and it wouldn't come back. And my husband was very, very happy to have this come back. Um, I'm trying to look at, I got lazy with my labeling. Sometimes your labeling um, can be because it's for a specific project. Um, like if you're doing it for something at Souter, I'm going to ask Joyce to step in and get me those postcards, that pile of postcards. Mm -hmm. And Joyce can say hello. This is Hi. Joyce. That's who you <laughs> talk to. So these have a different label. These were for postcards by the sea. I ran the sheets of fabric. They're like paper printer sheets, but they're fabric. And I ran them through my printer. 
Um, each one is labeled a little differently. I stitched it down and then I put these little stickers on it um, and they're to stitch down. They're fat, they're, they were for quilting. So each one has something a little different on it, but it's still stitched. Could somebody clip them off? Sure they could, sure they could. I was just fortunate nobody clipped that off. And that one, I don't have one on. So this is another way to label. This was a sheet of paper and I just typed it up and ran it through the printer. If you're going to do that, make sure it dries. Make sure you have 24 to 48 hours. It will smudge. Voice of experience. So Jeannie says you can get personalized labels from Esty very inexpensively. Yes, you can. You can. Um, and sometimes, and yep, on Etsy you can get them. Um, Joan Ray. Um, does a, I always buy every year at Caraway, Joan Ray does little ones and she's got some cats on them. Um, I'm sure at every hook in, there is somebody who has labels that they've made for rugs. Just make sure, the three things to make sure when you label your rug, the year you hooked it, your name, if there's any pertinent information, even if it's your address or where you hooked it, hooked it in Wells, Maine, Make sure it's secure and is going to stay on the rug. Now, at rug hooking shows in the past, I've seen information regarding the teacher and that Correct. too, yep. as well as the pattern name. Yep, you can do any, who, who, it's what, who you did it in what class, the name of the pattern. Anything you want to put, anything pertinent to this piece should go on here. Don't write a whole book, but make it pertinent. Okay. So do you pre-wash the label fabric first? Yes. Yes, you do. You can. If you're going to heat and bond it onto wool, you don't need to. Um, you know, if you're just going to use it as is, I would pre-wash it. But I would, if you're heat and bonding it onto wool, that's what I would do. Okay. And there's also ones that I've seen on Etsy um, that are very attractive, and I don't remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember whose shop it was in, but they were sheep. And they were just on the muslin. They weren't um, like this is on, you know, linen. It was just on the muslin. That might be a little weak for the back of your rug, and it might chafe. Make sure it's on good wool or on wool, again, that's a little synthetic that you're not going to use to hook with and put it on the back. Um, sometimes putting it in the corner is good, you know, securing it in the corner, stitching it in. Um, that's what I would do. I usually like to put them in the corner. Okay. Any other questions about labeling rugs? There's, there's a million different ways, but what I'm telling you is make sure that you label your rugs. I like the people who are ingenious and they work their name or they work their logo or who they are into their rugs. I think that's wonderful. Uh, I think that's a great way to do it as well. Then you don't need to label it. Uh, I've also seen where people now have put, if it's a wall hanging, a pocket here. And the pocket may be the label and about the rug and if it's a gift like a wedding gift or something the note to the bride and groom or the note to the new baby is tucked into the pocket also this is to make sure that the information about the rug travels with the rug if you journal your rug that's another way to make sure that if it ever disappears that it's your rug or if you're giving it as a gift and you've journaled the rug, make sure the journal goes to the person with the rug because I'm sure they would want that as well. What product do you use to bond the label to the wool? I just use heat and bond light. I just use a heat and bond light from Walmart. I use the light on it and that's all I use. So Jeannie asks, is there a way to hook your name in the wrong side and turn over and hook, and hook over. as usual? Yes, Bev Conway. Have you tried that? I have not tried that. Um, because Lisanne Miller is pretty long. I could do my initials, but you can hook it. If you hook it on this side, you hook it high on this side before you do your background. Bev Conway is the perfect person. She does hidden messages all the time, and you hook it real high on this side, like a normal hooking. It's very low here, and then you hook over it. So Jennifer asks, yes. where can you get the labels that you showed that you did to cut apart? Um, you can call us, or I believe they're on our Etsy shop. Yep, and uh, they're, um, and it's the, you can call the 800 number. Joyce, who you just met, will be happy to take your order. 
I think you get nine labels in the pack, but I don't think there's nine labels in the pack. You get all nine. Any other questions? Okay. Well, it's important. Make sure you bind your rug. Make sure your rug is bound well. We, you know, we take a lot of time to hook the rugs. Don't skimp on the binding. Make sure that it's secure. Make sure that it's worth what you put into it, that it's going to stand the test of time. And please make sure you label your rug. I'm so very happy that I did because I got this back. We will see you again next month. Um, and please send us what you would like us to do on the podcast, what you'd like me to talk about on the podcast, from color planning to dyeing to anything you would like. If Yes? Is this pattern available? I'm assuming she's asking about this pattern this here. Yes, here. it is. Yeah. Um, uh, it is available. I believe it's under our website, wcushing.com, under P is for primitive. Under P is for primitive. Um, but again, if there's any topics you'd like us to talk about, if there's if you want us to go back into the dye kitchen, um, I was thinking about doing a dip dye session so you can see a quicker way to dip dye or different ways to draw the color out. Anything you'd like to see, let us know. Okay, and if there's other questions that come up tonight, and um, I will answer them, or you can email me directly. So thank you so much. It's great to see everybody, and it's Hope everybody stays warm and stays healthy. Until next time, bye-bye.